Well, good afternoon, everyone. I know that people are um, sliding in, uh, but given our limited time, I think we'll just get underway. So welcome to this, the inaugural conversation in the Diplomacy and Diversity series. My name is Lois Harder, and I am principal of the Peter Lougheed Leadership College. It is my honor to host you today on behalf of my University of Alberta colleagues in the intersections of gender signature area and University of Alberta International. It is our university's practice to begin events such as this with a territorial acknowledgement. But of course, many of you are currently situated outside the bounds of Treaty 6 territory. I encourage you to reflect on your respective locations and the people who came before you who called that land home, as I respectfully acknowledge the lands on which the University of Alberta is situated, traditional territory of Cree, Blackfoot and Métis peoples and many others. The idea for this series on diversity and diplomacy is the brainchild of my colleague Alex Kuznetsov at University of Alberta International and a wonderful collaboration with Christian gonzalez Pias, Danielle Scott and Peter Carter, also of University of Alberta International, as well as Susanna Lumen and Rachel Zakuski from Intersections of Gender and my colleagues at the Peter Lougheed Leadership College. Today, of course, we are also extremely grateful to Consul General Lucia Piazza and her team at the US Consulate. The importance of equity, diversity, and inclusion is well established, at least rhetorically, in the public service of most countries. Yet this topic um, hasn't really been widely considered in the diplomatic context. On one hand, this attention, inattention seems a bit odd, given the cultural complexities of diplomatic service. It would seem to be a place where diversity is very much alive. On the other hand, it is in the interaction between nation states where we often witness the most overt articulations of nationalist tropes, including stereotypical, stereotypical ideas of the human who is supposed to embody or personify the nation. This series thus emerges from a curiosity about what happens when the people representing the nation state in their roles as diplomats and foreign service officers depart in some way because of their gender, their race, their sexuality from that national stereotype. So what does intersectionality in diplomacy look like on the ground? Today, Lucia Piazza, U.S. Consul General to Alberta, Saskatchewan, and the Northwest Territories, has generously offered to shed some light on those questions. Ms. Piazza joined the U.S. Foreign Service in 2001 and has represented her country in Uganda, Togo, Nigeria, and Tunisia. She has also served multiple tours in Washington, D.C., most recently as the Director of Crisis Management and Strategy in the Office of the Secretary of State. She took up her current post in Calgary in 2018. Ms. Piazza has received many awards for her service, including two superior honor awards for her leadership during the 2012 attack on the U.S. Embassy in Tunis, and a superior honor award in 2017 for her leadership of the State Department's response to Hurricanes Irma, Jose, and Maria. Ms. Piazza has agreed to join us today to discuss working around the globe as an LGBT plus diplomat. So I'm going to begin with some prepared questions for Consul General Piazza, and then I'm going to cede my responsibilities moderating to my colleague, uh, Dr. Susanna Lumen, who will be putting some of your questions to the Consul General. I know some folks submitted questions um, when you were registering, but if something else occurs to you as the discussion unfolds, please feel free to use the Q&A function on the bottom of your your Zoom screen uh, to post your questions. So, Consul General Piazza, let us begin, shall we? I'd like to ask you from the start a very uh, broad question. What drew you to a career in diplomacy and, and how did you chart your course? Well, first off, thank you so much for having me um, and for allowing me to, to participate in a very important conversation. Um, my story uh, into the Foreign Service actually started when I was three years old. Um, my father um, uh, immigrated from Italy to the US, joined the US Navy. Coming out of the Navy, he was recruited into the Foreign Service himself. 
Uh, so that was roughly when I was three years old. And I had the opportunity from then on um, to travel the world. And what I gained from that was a real desire to explore uh, a sense of adventure and a real curiosity um, about other cultures and other peoples. Um, as I got older and I realized um, how fortunate I was to have those opportunities and how fortunate I was to be raised um, as an American, um, I, and I really very much believe that America is a force for good, um, I was drawn to public service. And, and uh, at that point, I decided that, that the Foreign Service was the way I wanted to go. So that was, uh, that was my journey. Um, and uh, it's an interesting journey um, in, the, in the sense that um, I was an undergraduate student when I decided to take the test. Um, this was in the late 90s. And um, I was very fortunate that I passed the test and they offered me a job before I graduated. Uh, so I was stuck in this, this little bit of a quandary where um, you know, I wanted to join, but I hadn't graduated. So I was able to negotiate something where my professors let me take my finals early. Um, I could swear in, and then after swearing in, I went back and graduated from undergraduate school. Okay. So, I mean, I don't, I don't, I know the Foreign Service test has probably changed quite a bit since I was interested in joining the public service. <laughs> I didn't actually write the test, but I do remember one of the questions was, um, who was the founder of the National Ballet of Canada? So clearly one was going to have that. <laughs> a wide range of conversations with people. <laughs> so um, more seriously, you have, been, you have been at the leading edge of some very tumultuous moments. Uh, the attack on the US Embassy in Tunis in, in 2012, which was a part of a wave of attacks uh, on, US, on Western embassies throughout the Middle East, in, including the very infamous Benghazi moment. Um, and of course, you responded to the unfolding crisis of three hur major hurricanes happening in uh, the Caribbean in 2017. So Calgary must seem very calm, I would say. Um, but I'd be interested to know what, what skills you, you had and leaned on as you led through those events and, and also to contrast the difference between a kind of a, a terrorist attack and, and a natural disaster. Uh, you're right, Calgary is a, is, is a, a little, it's is more quiet. Uh, I will say I wasn't expecting a global pandemic, um, so, <laughs> so that threw me. Um, but yeah, no, we love it here. So thank you for, first of all, for allowing us to be guests uh, in your country. Um, I, you know, I, you, you touched on two crises that, that have had a significant impact on my career. Um, but uh, I, I swear it's not me. They seem to follow me because my very first assignment in Uganda, I arrived during an Ebola outbreak. Um, and, and that was something we were managing. And then, of course, there was the, the war um, in, uh, in South Sudan, in that region that was spilling over into Uganda. Um, my next assignment in Togo, um, I was doing consular work where we assist uh, US citizens. And um, I dealt with a commercial uh, airline plane crash and uh, sort of the identification of uh, and retrieval of, of the remains of, of US citizens. And from that, I went to um, uh, my first experience with civil unrest also in Togo, um, when the second longest serving president in the world at the time after Fidel Castro, Nassim Riyadima died and there was a coup. Um, so it has kind of followed me um, and I will say that, that with every experience, I think I've, I've learned a new skill set. Um, and, and I've had the benefit of, of having tremendous leaders to watch early on in my career as I transitioned into, um, into leadership roles. Um, you know, I, I, I did a, a TEDx talk um, on, on crisis leadership. Um, and, and the things I touched on there, I think, you know, apply leadership broadly, um, but in particular crisis leadership, you know, you, you have to have um, trust with, uh, with your, your colleagues and your teammates. Um, you have to have communication. Um, we say, when you think you've started to communicate, when you think you're communicating, you've only just started um, because that's the first thing to go in a crisis. Um, those are the types of, of things that, in terms of skill set and learning to do, um, you know, I've had the opportunity to emulate others, um, to observe others, and to develop those skill sets. Um, the two crises you mentioned, the crisis in, uh, in Tunis um, and the crisis uh, with uh, these hurricanes striking um, in the Caribbean, um, clearly, you know, very different. 
Uh, in Tunis, um, Tunis was a bit of a slow burn. You know, we had first started with activity um, with the Arab Spring, um, and that had had a significant impact. And I think what the net effect of that was, was that it really raised our awareness collectively. Um, so that gave us the time to build up um, the skill set that you need to handle uh, a threat that is a direct threat to you, as opposed to a hurricane. A hurricane's not trying to kill you. Um, a hurricane mm -hmm. is a force of nature. Um, you know, when you're in a situation when you are the actual target of whatever that threat is, you have to develop a certain skill set to mitigate those risks. Um, so what, one of the things that we do in, in our training is we play something called the what if game. Um, and the what if game is basically, as you're driving along, what would I do if, you know, a car tried to ram me? What would I do if, you know, this avenue was blocked and I needed to go that other way? And we, and we develop that into training over the course of, I would say, eight to 12 months, um, because that was roughly the time period between when the Arab Spring happened and then when our embassy was attacked uh, on September 14th, 2012. Um, while we weren't expecting an attack uh, on that day, um, all of that sort of planning and preparation paid off because one thing I've learned, and, and this is one of the things I used to tell my ambassadors and, and deputies um, as they were heading out to, to run their embassies around the world, um, if you don't train, you are al almost always guaranteed to fail in a crisis because when you're in an adrenaline situation like that, you, you operate on instinct and instinct comes from training. Um, your brain just shuts down. It's a biological function. It's fight, you know, fight or flight. And if you haven't thought about what you're going to do, that's you're going to face certain challenges. Um, as you know, as opposed to a hurricane, um, you know, we watched these hurricanes form um, off the coast of Africa, and had you know seven to ten days to to put together um, a a coordinated response. And the real challenge there is pacing. Um, when you're in an acute crisis. Um, like a terrorist attack, um, you know, all your adrenaline rushes and you get through that and then there's the aftermath, but that's what you need in the moment because you need to get through that immediate time. Um, whereas when you're, when you're planning and you're watching and scenarios are evolving and you're working on the logistics and you're working on communication and you're working on coordination with other governments and, and other elements within your own government, um, that pacing is really important and having a strong team that can plug and play and fill in for you. Um, is also absolutely critical. Yeah, I, I received some advice recently or on observation that um, in a crisis, one does not rise to one's level of expectation, but rather falls to one's level of training. So clearly uh, that has been your experience as well. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. I, I'm going to steal that. Okay, you're welcome to it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, you know, we're, we're here talking about diversity and the way that diversity impacts um, one's capacity to do a job. So, you know, reflecting on those situations or others, I'm interested in how um, a diverse workplace has made a difference for you, if, if indeed you have worked in a diverse workplace or if you are the diversity in your workplace. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I would be intrigued to know more about the history of diversity in the realm of diplomacy um, and how and whether it's made a difference in, in your experience. Um, yeah, I think, you know, the, there, there have been plenty of studies done, um, you know, Harvard Business School, I know, did, did a study about, you know, the value of diversity in uh, corporate boards. Um, you know, there's, there's a real business case. Um, to be made for, for bringing in folks with the diversity of, you know, when we talk about diversity too, I want to, I want to define what, what at least I mean, you know, we're not, we're not talking solely, um, you know, when, when we think about diversity, you know, race, age, sex, gender, uh, socioeconomic, we're, we're talking for me really the whole, the whole gamut of, of, of experience, um, you know, even within the context of the United States, you know, we talk about regional diversity when we recruit foreign service officers, because we don't want everybody from the East Coast, right? We, we, we have targeted recruitment efforts to different parts of the US. Um, you know, I, de I definitely think diversity um, has made a, a huge impact on me. And there have been instances where I am the diverse candidate, uh, usually because I'm a woman, I'm not often perceived uh, immediately, um, you know, as, as a member of the LGBTI community. Uh, although of course that is clearly part of my identity. Um, but I, one of the things that I'm most proud of, I think, with, with my organization, the State Department and the U.S. Foreign Service, is, um, you know, particularly starting 
um, well, I joined under Colin Powell. So I, was, I took the test under uh, uh, the Clinton administration and I joined under the Bush administration. And, uh, you know, Secretary Colin Powell uh, really brought in this huge push for, for diversity. And we have done, I think, a, a good job, but we still have a lot to do. Um, in the senior ranks, so where I am now, um, even though we recruit at 50-50, male-female, for instance, by the time we come to our senior ranks, it's almost skewed 70-30, uh, male-female. So, you know, one of the questions we have is, is why, why is that happening? Um, in terms of LGBT diversity and other diversity um, uh, of the traditional sense that we talk about in the Foreign Service, um, you know, I think it's fair to say that, that in some elements we have been um, slower to adapt and evolve than, than others. You know, as early as the 1970s, if you were a woman in the U.S. Foreign Service and you uh, got married, um, you had to resign. Um, you know, as early as, you know, as, as late as the 90s, if you were an LGBT uh, foreign service officer, um, you could lose your security clearance. And without a security clearance, you lose your employment. Um, so, uh, you know, our, our history has been, has been slow. And even on the issue of LGBT diversity um, and inclusion, um, that has been, you know, even as far as, as, as now, to be honest, um, you know, there's still a lot of work. Uh, to do. Okay. okay. So, I mean, promote, you, promoting LGBTQ rights is is an important part of your identity. You've you've very graciously welcomed to, uh, been welcomed to this series. So, um, you joined, as you said, you joined under Colin Powell. Um, you've served for a number of administrations and, you know, many of us are scratching our heads a little bit about what's going on with the Trump administration. So I, I'm, I'm interested to know what the climate is for um, LGBTQI diplomats um, through, uh, over that period of time, but also particularly now under the Trump administration. Yeah, no, and I appreciate that question. Um, you know, like I mentioned, I came in under, under George uh, W. Bush. Um, who is perhaps less known for the tremendous work um, he did, uh, his administration did on HIV AIDS um, and through a program called PEPFAR. Um, under uh, President Obama, uh, before gay marriage was legalized, uh, you know, this was really the first administration, you know, a presidential administration that um, made it, you know, possible for families like mine to serve overseas. Um, you know, before it was an administrative thing that you might not think about, right? But having a diplomatic passport, for instance, um, allowed my my wife certain privileges, but she wasn't eligible for a diplomatic passport because we weren't married, and we weren't married because we couldn't be married. Um, and it turns out that wasn't the law; that was a regulation. So that's one of the things that the Obama administration, you know, everything that they could do short of what was prescribed, you know, by the law at the time they made available to us so that, you know, I no longer had to pay her plane ticket for her to join me at post. Whereas, you know, my, my colleague, his wife had her plane ticket. Those are the types of things that we saw, I think, as improvements under the Obama administration. Um, you know, the Trump administration has been very forward leaning. And one of the things that um, I think folks don't uh, realize is that the Trump administration is the first administration to make decriminalizing um, uh, uh, yeah, the law exactly, I'm trying to remember exactly that phrase, but decriminalizing homosexuality, um, that is part of our foreign policy, and that's never been part of our foreign policy. Um, you know, President Trump's also the first president to appoint um, an acting director of national intelligence um, who is openly gay, Rick Grinnell, who's also um, our U.S. ambassador to, to Germany. Um, so, you know, in terms of, of, of the progression, you know, th this administration has continued uh, building on the prog progress that, you know, I, I saw, um, you know, from the Bush administration on. And, you know, of course, even under the Clinton administration, Clinton administration was don't ask, don't tell uh, for the military, but they were also the administration that uh, made discriminating against people based on uh, sexual orientation illegal. So I think everyone is built on their predecessor's efforts. Uh, no doubt people will have more questions about that. Um, but I'm going to shift gears a little bit to ask you about um, conscious bias and implicit bias and the ways in which, you know, when you show up as a kind of diversity candidate or person, um, that, 
you know, people have certain expectations about you, but I think also because uh, we might put our armor on in, in a situation like that, um, we also come with certain expectations of, of if we are the diversity candidate, how we are going to be treated. So, you know, particularly in a context of sensitive international diplomacy and negotiations, um, that, that feels like a space where those assumptions could be could be super complicated and, and the stakes could be even more heightened. So I'm, I'm wondering if that squares with your experience um, and how you have found yourself negotiating those kinds of assumptions, um, yours of others, others of you, et cetera. Yeah, yeah I, I, I love that question. Um, it's a great question because um, one of the things that I've had to do in particular because I've, I've, been, I've been driven to um, really work in places that aren't necessarily friendly to LGBT persons. You know, my first assignment was Uganda, uh, which clearly is not a friendly environment. Um, you know, I, I spent uh, a significant amount of time in Sudan, which, you know, sort of drew me to want to learn Arabic. So I've, I've you know, I did, I had the opportunity to learn Arabic and then work in that part of the world. Um, and, and, you know, uh, I'll be very frank, you know, that I made assumptions about others that weren't fair to them. Um, you know, I, I assumed that, you know, they weren't going to want to interact with me because I was, you know, gay or because I was a woman or, you know, that I wasn't going to be effective. Um, and I found that, um, I think really in every single instance that wasn't the case. Um, you know, those were, that was me projecting my fears onto others. You know, and a perfect example of, of a relationship that has endured um, now for over a decade um, was with uh, a woman in, uh, in Tunisia um, who is, you know, a, a very close friend of mine. Um, and we, we connected over the fact that we both have special needs kids. Um, and, and that was, you know, uh, that was our connection. You know, we're both, we're both professional women. We both have children with these needs. Um, and it wasn't until later that my, my, you know, conversation about my sexuality became a thing. And I remember her saying to me, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad you didn't lead with that because if you'd led with that, I wouldn't have gotten to know you. And, and, and this isn't an issue for me. Um, and I learned from that, that, you know, it's, it's incumbent upon me to, to also be uh, mindful of other cultures and, and how I show myself. Um, I'm, I'm always me, I'm always authentically me. Um, but, um, because that's important. You know, there was a period of time in my life where I was not comfortable and I was not out and I will say that I was not the greatest diplomat. Um, uh, that I think changed a lot for me when I, be, when I reached that point where I was comfortable. Um, you know, be, being authentic and being respectful can go hand in hand, um, in my opinion. And, and I think that that has helped me be successful uh, where perhaps other colleagues of mine may not have had as much success. Um, focusing just very briefly on being a woman in the Arab world. Um, you know, I actually found that to be uh, rather than be a hindrance, it was an advantage. Uh, because while my male colleagues could only interact with men, I could interact with both, uh, which broadened sort of my, my perspective on what was going on in the country as compared to, to some of my male colleagues. Yeah, there is always something about being perceived to be a bit marginalized, where you get to hear things that, you know, the, the official story doesn't necessarily offer you. So yeah, I can, I can certainly see that. So I know that we have some, some people participating today who are very interested in joining the public service. Um, so I'm wondering if you could give some advice maybe to minority undergraduate students who are interested in the foreign service and um, also wondering, you know, do you have to have a degree in political science? to join the foreign service is is the profession open to people with the diversity of experiences and, and training yeah and, and not absolutely not only is it is it open to it um it is it is highly encouraged um you know as we were talking earlier about the, the importance of diversity in, in in teams um you know our, our colleagues who are scientists right now who join the foreign service are are experts during this global pandemic um, because in addition to, to bringing sort of the diplomacy aspect of it, they can help us understand um, the scientific pieces behind it that perhaps inform how we pursue our foreign policy. Um, so I will say, first off, I've had the opportunity to work with Canadian diplomats in, all over the world. Um, and, and you have one of the finest foreign services uh, in, in the world. 
Um, so if anyone was interested in joining the US Foreign Service, absolutely. Uh, if you're an American citizen, I'm happy to talk to you about that. Um, but if you're interested in joining the Canadian Foreign Service, my experience is that, that your officers um, are uh, equally um, diverse in experience and in, uh, in their background. I do have a degree in political science and, and you'll find that most folks in, uh, in the US uh, Foreign Service at least have some a background in political science and international relations, but at least actually in the US Foreign Service, a lot of people don't realize this, a college degree is not a requirement. The only requirement to be a US diplomat is you have to be 21 years of age, a US citizen, uh, be able to obtain a security clearance uh, and, and be able to serve at least at the outset of your career pretty much anywhere in the world, what we call worldwide available. So you have to have a medical clearance. Um, but there are no educational requirements. Um, I'm not 100% certain what the system uh, on, on the Canada front is, um, but yeah. Um, but no, I would, I would encourage um, anyone who's interested in adventure, anyone who's passionate about learning um, you know, about other cultures, um, anyone who is um, you know, interested in, 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 in having the opportunity to truly immerse yourself. You know, I've been a tourist and I've traveled places, but there's no substitute for you know, figuring out how to get groceries and you know, learning how to drive and, and all of the little things that go into um, being an active member of a different culture. Even in a place as similar as Calgary, um, I will say that there, there are some differences um, culturally. Uh, I'll give you a very, very specific example, by the way. Um, I'm from New York, where jaywalking is like a national sport. Um, <laughs> um, in, in Calgary, uh, that just really doesn't seem to be a thing. <laughs> and uh, it took me a while to adapt to that. And when I was in Washington in, in March, um, you know, I would come to a, you know, a crosswalk and the light's red and I would just stand there and there's no cars and, you know, people were walking past me and it would take me a good 15, 20 seconds to remember that, you know, like I can, you know, I can cross now, even though it says I can't. Um, maybe not the greatest example, but, you know, those are the, it becomes a part of you. I, I've taken a little bit of something um, and not just the artwork you see behind me. I've taken a little bit of something from, from every country um, I've had the privilege of serving in. Great. All right. Well, I am going to turn over my hosting duties now to my colleague, Susanna Lumen. Um, Susanna has been collecting up some questions along the way, and uh, so I will, I will let her proceed. Susanna, I see you're on mute there. I now unmuted me and I'm zooming in. So thank you so much, um, Lucia and, and Lois for this um, really interesting conversation. There is a kind of uh, some question that we got from um, people as they were registering and some questions that are showing up on the screen now. So I'm kind of going to bundle them a little bit. Um, but it, it seems to me that people are quite interested, our audience are quite interested to hear a bit more from you, Lucia, about strategies that you use when you encounter individuals or organizations that are not supportive of LGBTQI plus rights and either articulate that um, quite openly or, or, you know, you know what they stand for. How do you, I, I think there's an interest in the audience to see what do you do? What are your strategies to negotiate that? Yeah, you know, that's, that's a great question. Um, oftentimes, um, I, I have to say, frankly, I, I haven't experienced it too much because oftentimes people can see past that and recognize that I am the American diplomat representing uh, the United States. Um, so they, they've often kind of put that aside, um, you know, but as I was mentioning when I spoke to Lois, um, you know, having a, a, an understanding of the culture uh, you're operating in. So, you know, you don't go in arrogant. You don't go in saying, you know, this is, this is my position and you're going to bow to me, right? You go in with this, this, this um, sense of, you know, how do I learn the environment so that I can be authentically me within the context of this environment? so that I can establish the relationships that allow me to be effective. Um, and I think that's been, um, for me personally, and there, there are different schools of thought on this, right? You know, and, and I think that there's, there's a lot to be said for, for folks who lead with that and are a little bit more in your face. Um, there's, a, there's a role uh, within the LGBTIQ movement for, for that um, type of engagement. But diplomacy is more subtle and, and diplomacy is relationship-based. 
And if you can't establish a relationship with someone because you have, you know, kind of come out, um, no pun intended, um, you know, with, with that as your as your first foot forward, um, you you run the risk of not really being able to establish. So for me, strategically, um, what I have found works best again is 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 to really take the time um, uh, to to understand my environment, to understand the folks with whom I'm trying to um, connect, and then of course to to connect with folks on multiple levels. Um, you know, I, I sometimes say. You know, being uh, LGBTQ is, you know, being a lesbian is not the most interesting thing about me. Um, it is very much an important part of me, um, but I am also, you know, um, a lot of other things. I'm a mother. I'm, 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 I'm a wife. Uh, you know, I like working out. There, there are lots of ways to connect with people, and and often when you do that, um, these other things that might be an issue um, otherwise um, are very easily overcome. Thank you. Um, another question that um, I see here is, so you, you mentioned um, uh, the kind of recruitment office of di efforts of diverse um, 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 members of diverse communities to join the, the foreign service. Um, one question I received here is, uh, what are the efforts to keep members of diverse communities? Because we of course all know that those of us who are minorities because of gender or sexuality or race or um, often have a, you know, have a much harder time to be authentic as you um, um, pointed out and to live authentically in context where, you know, where the environment um, wants you to be there, but um, is it actually an environment that, um, is conducive to, to being authentic oneself. So the question here is really, um, you know, what are the efforts to not just recruit diverse um, employees, but also um, to have to, to keep people in the foreign service? Yeah, no, I think that's that's a that's a great question. The retention piece, um, I think, is is clearly where uh, we need to do a better job. And I know that senior leaders in the department are aware of that. Um, I mentioned earlier when Melissa and I were speaking that um, even though we recruit at gender parity, by the time we get to the senior ranks, um, we find that that, that balance is, is quite skewed. Um, and, and there are certainly uh, efforts right now to try and figure out like why that piece of it is. You know, for, for LGBT um, officers like myself, um, the, the biggest challenge we have is serving in countries um, safely with our families. Mm -hmm. So under the Obama administration, you know, some of the other sort of more technical barriers, the, you know, my spouse can't have a passport, I, you know, the financial uh, implications of having to pay for their plane ticket, all of those things kind of went away. And I think that helped with our retention. Um, so looking for the things that you can change, even if they're not, you know, you know, with a magic wand gay marriage at the time, um, but they are things that were within the control of the organization and the organization could change it. Um, that I think made a huge difference. Um, now that, you know, um, uh, gay marriage is legal in the U.S. and uh, we're treated equally, uh, at least within our system, uh, the next step is, is giving us the ability to serve everywhere that our colleagues can serve. Um, a big challenge that we run into is that not every country will recognize my spouse, for instance. So one of the beautiful things about living in Canada is we had no issues. You know, I, I went to the, the embassy in Washington and applied for a visa. And you know that was that. No questions asked. Um, well, lots of questions asked, but uh, <laughs> it, it didn't become a thing. Um, you know, whereas now, you know, we're in this unfortunate situation where we're going to have to leave Canada uh, next summer, so summer of 2021. And you know, we're taking a look at the list. And while my colleagues are looking at, you know, what schools are available for kids, and you know, what medical concerns, I have to overlay a layer of that, um, which is, you know, where can I'd be sure that my wife will have the same protections that other people's spouses will have. Um, you know, we talk about privileges and immunities, um, and privileges and immunities are really, really important for a diplomat to be able to do their job effectively. They, they, they essentially protect you from interference and harassment from the host country. And if I take my spouse with me to a country that doesn't, uh, you know, that, that criminalizes homosexuality, for instance, right. and I don't right. have protections for her, you know, that, that creates a massive vulnerability. Um, one of the things, again, you know, started under the Obama administration and now under the Trump administration has been a real push to these countries to say, you know, you're going to recognize our families. 
Um, and, you know, we're not going to really tolerate a conversation about, you know, you know, we don't recognize this marriage. Um, we do. And, and they've made a, a real principled step on that. That said, you know, it's, it's still challenging. So um, I, I, I would say that those efforts um, to make the assignments available equally, because the assignments are what get us promoted to, I think, you know, is the other thing, right? It's, it's, so that becomes an artificial barrier to promotion when you can't have the same opportunities as some of your colleagues. Um, so that's, uh, I think, room for, for growth. Um, and again, you know, I, I, I credit the, uh, the current administration um, for making it part of their push um, that, you know, they, that, you know, decriminalizing homosexuality is part of, uh, is part of this administration's priority. Right. Okay. Thank you. So, I mean, maybe one last question. I think we're coming um, a bit to, towards the end. It's a 45 minutes of very fast, um, uh, very fast 45 minutes here when we have an interesting conversation. I guess one of the questions from, that also comes up is the question of diplomacy in itself, in the sense of what do you do when you are, um, at a, find yourself disagreeing actually with, um, the, you know, with some of the policies or practices of the nation that you are representing? And I, you know, it's very interesting you talk about the Trump administration. But of course, um, your boss, which I assume is President Trump right now, um, is actually tweeting actively um, homophobic, transphobic uh, messages. I think we cannot deny that. So I imagine that there is some kind of difference between um, those tweets and what you say is happening in, in the administration that you are describing as quite forward-leaning and um, um, progressive in some ways um, when it comes to the rights of LGBTQ and I plus people. But what do you do when you find yourself in a conflict which surely must happen even if you have a diplomatic mindset and heart and um, uh, temperament when you find yourself in a, in a disagreement with, uh, you know, what your nation or your the policies of your nation stand for and your own um, views? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, first off, um, you know, I'm here to comment, uh, or I, I can comment on policy. I can comment on what is official policy. And, and, and what I described is, is the official policy of, of, of the government of the United States. Um, but you know, it, that, that's a great question. You know, when I joined in 2001, you know, I was in Washington during September 11th and you know, I had just gotten to post, um, you know, when, when, we, when the war in Iraq started. And um, there were a large number of my colleagues um, who chose to resign um, over, in, in protest uh, of the, um, you guys have me saying protest and not protest. I can't, can't say it anymore. I've become Canadian. See what I was talking about? Um, but there are a number of my colleagues who chose to, to resign because they disagreed with that administration's policies. Um, you know, there, similarly, there were, there were folks who, who resigned under the Obama administration. And, and there have been, I think, some, some resignations that um, have been quite public uh, under the current administration. I think for me, um, what, what, what keeps me uh, in the service, I think we all have red lines. I certainly have red lines. Um, and if I ever were to feel like there was something there that I could not, um, in good conscience, um, you know, contribute toward, um, I, I would resign, right? And I think that's the honorable thing for anyone to do. Um, when we join the Foreign Service, we raise our right hand and we take an oath. And if you've watched Hollywood movies, you've seen the oath. You know, I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America, et cetera. Um, the oath is to the Constitution of the United States, and the people of the United States are the ones who elect the leaders of the country, and it is, the, it is those elected leaders who make the policies of the country. My job is to, is to advise, not, not just my job, all of us, our job is to advise, um, to, to debate, uh, to provide a foreign perspective on, on what a policy might mean in a different part of the world. Um, but ultimately, my job is to implement. Um, so it, it's not, um, you know, it, it's, it's not, to me, relevant, uh, to be honest, you know, um, as long as that person is the duly elected uh, leader of, of the country. Um, so that's, that's how I've approached it. And I think that that's how the vast majority of my colleagues have approached it. And for those for whom something has reached a red line, they've done the honorable thing and they've resigned. 
Thank you so much, Lucia. That uh, was really, really interesting. There are many more questions, but we are running out of time. So I'm giving back to Lois for some closing comments. Thank you. Well, just, just also to say thank you so much to you, Lucia, and to all of the audience for, for taking the time in your afternoon to join us. This is, as I said, the, the first of this series. We are, are hoping to have several more, um, although not scheduled yet, but do stay tuned. Um, you know, wherever you found your information about this, uh, there will be more information posted shortly. We'll also have a recording and a transcript of this event, which should be available in about two weeks time. Um, it will be posted on YouTube and again, you can connect to it through University of Alberta in International, through Intersections of Gender, and also through the Peter Lougheed Leadership College. And we certainly encourage you to share that conversation with others if you're interested. So thank you again to Lucia, to Susanna, to all of my co collaborators on this endeavor. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.